So next we have presenting Colin DeYoung, who worked on a project this summer with Drs. Brent Lofgren and Jia Wong. Hi, Colin, welcome. We can't, you're muted. Can you see me now? Yes, we can hear and see you. Everything looks great. All right, awesome. Thank you for the introduction, Mary. As Mary mentioned, my name is Colin. I currently am a student at Central Michigan University pursuing a degree in meteorology. And then this summer, I worked with my mentors, Dr. Bram Lofgren and Dr. Jia Wong on the project Upper Level Atmospheric Circulation Patterns Associated with Great Lakes Ice Cover. And today, we're going to go through some of the background and some of the motivation behind this project. And then we will discuss some of the methodology and some of the analysis that we did to the ice cover data. And then we will mainly focus on the results of this project and then summarize everything up at the end very nicely. To start off with the background and things that we know, we know that teleconnection patterns cause significant differences in variables such as sea surface temperatures, surface pressure, rainfall, and examples of these patterns include the El Nino Southern Oscillation. We also have the North Atlantic Oscillation, the Eastern Pacific Oscillation, and we know that some of these patterns on their own show some correlation to ice cover in the Great Lakes region. However, how strong is that relationship to Great Lake ice cover? And luckily, one of my mentors, Dr. Wong, was able to look at this back in 2012, where he and some other authors developed a model based on teleconnection patterns, such as the El Nino Southern Oscillation and the North Atlantic Oscillation, and developed models and did regressions to ice cover for each of the individual Great Lakes. And while I don't have time to go through all the results of that paper, we can conclude that from that paper, they found that there was significant relationships between the collective teleconnection patterns and ice cover in the Great Lakes region. However, there is still the idea that teleconnection patterns and their correlation to ice cover in the Great Lakes region isn't too strong. It may just be a result of a causation. So we wanted to look at any potential atmospheric patterns that may show stronger relationships to ice cover in the Great Lakes region. And we looked at the following four variables. The first one is the 500 mil of our geopotential height, abbreviated by this capital Phi symbol, which is going to be a measure of the height in the atmosphere in which the air pressure is equal to 500 millibars. And this is gonna be a very important variable to look at because patterns of 500 millibar heights are very important for the movements of pressure systems at the surface, as well as mid to upper level flow. So we definitely wanna keep in mind what this variable is and how it impacts the variables at the surface as well. We looked at the surface air temperature, abbreviated the SAT. We looked at the mean sea level pressure, which is gonna be the pressure at an elevation adjusted down to sea level. And then we also looked at the wind as well, broken down into its two components, the U, which is the west and east component, and the V component, which is the north and south component, as well as the collective wind vectors as well. And before we can figure out how these atmospheric patterns of those four variables relate to ice cover in the Great Lakes, we first have to discern and set our ice cover into two separate categories so that we can figure out how atmospheric patterns are in relation to different um, levels of ice cover. So we separated our ice cover data from Gorlo's Great Lake Ice Cover Database into two separate categories, high ice years and low ice years. And these were calculated through the following formula. If the ice cover for Lake Superior for a given year from 1973 to 2021 was greater than the long-term mean plus the standard deviation, then it was considered a high ice year. It is a low ice year if the ice cover for Lake Superior is less than long-term mean minus the standard deviation. And through this method, we were able to select 10 high ice years and 12 low ice years. And once we have each of these individual years, we can now create yearly averages for each of our atmospheric patterns based on a three month average in the winter time from December to February. We do that for each individual high and low ice year. And once we have created all of the yearly averages, we now want to make a collective high ice year average and a collective low ice year average. You kind of see what is the mean or average pattern for each of these different varying modes of ice cover. And this is the result of that computation. Plotted on the left is going to be the high ice year averages, and plotted on the right is going to be our low ice year averages. Now on the top, we have our 500 mil of our height atmospheric pattern, which for both the high and low ice years shows a very traditional pattern of ridging in which these contours curve up. 
and troughing where the contours curve down, where the ridging is near the kind of the Gulf of Alaska region and troughing is kind of near the Great Lakes, Hudson Bay region for both the high and low ice years. We can see for the high ice years how this pattern of ridging and troughing is a bit more amplified than it is for the low ice years, but overall these patterns look relatively similar. For the surface air temperature, these patterns upon first glance look very similar. The main thing I want to point out is that in the Great Lakes region, the temperature at the surface for the high ice years is going to be less than it is for the low ice years, which this intuitively makes sense. For the pressure, we can see how when we get the high and low ice year averages for the pressure, we can see how it yields very defined high and low pressure systems for both the high and low ice years. We can see how we have a low pressure system off of the coast of Alaska, another low pressure system in the North Atlantic, and then we have a high pressure system off the western coast of the United States, and another high pressure system off the eastern coast as well. Both is true for the high and low ice here. And winds at the surface in general rotate counterclockwise around a low pressure system, and they will rotate clockwise around a high pressure system. And that can be seen in the wind vector field plotted here, where around that low pressure system in the Gulf of Alaska region, we have that counterclockwise rotation. And then in that high pressure system off the west coast of the United States, we have the clockwise rotation, which is true for both the high and low ice years. The main thing I want to point out when analyzing these figures is it is not easy to distinguish differences between the high and low ice years for each of our atmospheric patterns. So the way that we can do that is take our high, low, high ice years and subtract off the low ice years, and then we can plot the difference between those two long-term means. And this is going to be the result of that computation. When we subtract the high minus the low ice year averages for each of our patterns, it yields positive and negative anomalies, some in varying regions for all of our variables. For example, we have a positive anomaly near the Gulf of Alaska for 500 millibar G potential heights, where a positive anomaly is going to mean that on average for a high ice year, the 500 millibar heights in this location will be larger than they would be on average for a low ice year. Conversely, for a negative anomaly, let's say, for example, the negative anomaly for SAT near the Great Lakes region, kind of the Hudson Bay region, a negative anomaly is going to mean that for high ice years, on average, the surface air temperature in this case will be less than it is for the low ice years. And by doing this computation for all of our variables, it yields varying centers of positive and negative anomalies. We mostly want to pay attention to the differences that are considered significant. And areas that are shaded in gray on all of these maps are going to be considered significant based on a two-tailed t-test that we performed on both the high and low ice year data sets. And what this test does, it looks at, it compares the differences between the two data sets and their means and figures out if they are significant based on that analysis. So anywhere that is shaded on gray is going to be a difference that is of, of importance to us. Based on the different positive and negative anomalies that we saw on some of the previous maps, we decided collectively on four main areas of interest the Gulf of Alaska, the Hudson Bay, the North Atlantic, and the North Pacific as well. So we have two positive centers and we have two negative centers. And we can develop different indexes by looking at the difference between a positive center and a negative center. For example, for the two point index, we can look at what is the 500 millibar height value in the center of this positive anomaly. We can subtract off the 500 millibar value for the negative anomaly in case of the two-point index. And this will give us a singular value that we can use. The three-point index is going to be the Gulf of Alaska plus the North Atlantic Center minus two times the Hudson Bay. We want to do two times the Hudson Bay because we have two positive centers in this equation and we want to offset those by doubling the one negative center. And then for the four-point index is going to be the Gulf of Alaska plus the North Atlantic minus the Hudson Bay minus the North Pacific centers. And then once we have these index values, we can now start to perform some statistical analyses on our indexes and to the ice cover in the Great Lakes region. Before we can do that, though, we have to real quick normalize each of our variables yearly mean so that they all have a similar scale that does not distort the variables. And we can do this by taking an individual year's value, subtracting the long term mean from it and then dividing it by the standard deviation. What this formula does is it takes all of our variables which have differing units, differing sizes, and puts them on a common scale that does not have units. So we can look at an index value 
and it can be applicable for all of our variables. Once we have done that to our data, we can now perform a linear regression of each of our variables normalized data for each individual year and perform that regression in correlation to the ice cover or the annual maximum ice cover for the Great Lakes. And that will yield us a correlation coefficient value for each of our indexes, labeled by this R symbol for the two-point index, the three-point index, as well as the four-point index as well for each of our atmospheric patterns. And this R value or this correlation coefficient value is going to be a measure of the strength of the relationship between these two variables, in this case, the index and the ice cover, the annual maximum ice cover. We can see that the strongest relationships in this case relative to their indexes are the 500 millibar two-point index with a correlation coefficient value of 0.76 and the SAT two and three-point index. And this is a bit more visualization of what that regression looks like. We can see the positive linear relationship that we have between our indexes and the ice cover. As we see, this trend line goes up over time as we go along our axes right here. We're going to have our two-point index or our three-point index on the x-axis, and we will have the ice cover on the y-axis. And each of these points on this graph represent a year from 1973 to 2021, with each year having a corresponding index value and a corresponding annual maximum ice cover value. And all of those points from 1973 to 2021 are plotted on the scatter plot and the best fit line, the correlation can be calculated from there. What this positive linear relationship means between the index and the ice cover is that we can associate an index value with a level of ice cover. For example, we can look at a negative index value and see that it is generally correlated with lower ice cover, or we can look at a positive index value and we can see that it's gonna be correlated with higher cover in general. And this is gonna be the power of this index that we created. Once we establish that this relationship exists, we now wanted to separate our time period from 1973 to 2021 into two separate time periods based on a significant event, the El Nino winter, which led to significant changes in Lake Superior's ice metrics. And that can be seen from the time series plot on the right right here. We can see significant differences in the mean and the standard deviation before and after this El Nino winter that occurred. So we wanted to perform the same analysis that we did before for the long-term data, except now we want to look at it in terms of these two different time series. And that is going to be a result of this regression that we did. For the 500 mil of our two-point index, we can see how the positive linear relationship remains for our figures. Then we can see how the correlation coefficient is about the same as it was for the long-term data in terms of the geopotential height. We can see how it's a bit higher for the second regime. It's R is equal to 0.78. However, it is still relatively similar to the first regime and the long-term data. But these findings help show to us that even when you separate these into two separate regimes, you still have a strong positive correlation between your index and the annual maximum ice cover. For the SAT, it was a little bit different than the 500 millibar heights. When we looked at the SAT two-point index, we saw that for the first regime, the correlation was less than it was for the long-term data. And for the second regime, the correlation was stronger than it was for both the first regime and the long-term data. We can still see how that positive linear relationship is maintained. However, the strength of the relationship is not consistent for the regimes and the long-term data. For, we looked at the three-point index as well for the SAT. We still found a positive linear relationship. However, for the first regime, the relationship between this three-point index and the ice cover was a lot stronger with an R value of 0.76 than it was for the long-term or even the second regime, which showed a weaker relationship to the ice cover. And this difference can be visualized by plotting that same difference again between the high and low ice years, except now we're going to separate it by regime as we did before. We can still see common centers that we noticed before, for example, the positive anomaly in the Gulf of Alaska, and the negative anomaly in the Hudson Bay for all of our plots. However, the main thing I wanna point out is the existence of this positive anomaly in the North Atlantic for both the 500 mil of our heights and the SAT for the first regime. This positive anomaly is present for both of these variables in that first regime. However, in the second regime, this positive anomaly center does not exist, which is most likely to explain for the discrepancies for the SAT in terms of the three-point index as remembering 
the North Atlantic Center is included in that index calculation. So to kind of wrap everything up, we found that the difference between the high and low ice yields, yields defined anomalous centers near the Gulf of Alaska and the Hudson Bay for all of our variables, except for the mean sea level pressure. We know that based on the T-test, these differences are considered significant as they exceed the 95% significance level that we calculated. When we performed a regression of our two-point index as well as our three-point index with the SAT, it showed strong linear relationships for both of those variables, where our mean sea level pressure and our wind components had the weakest correlations overall for all of the indices. We didn't just want to make our index and leave it at that. We wanted to also compare our index to an already established teleconnection pattern index, in this case, the Eastern Pacific Oscillation Index, and we wanted to perform the same evaluation that we did, except we're going to replace our index with the Eastern Pacific Oscillation Index, and that is plotted on the right right here. And we can see that this teleconnection pattern index also has a positive linear relationship with the annual maximum ice cover. However, the relationship and the strength of the relationship between the teleconnection pattern index and the ice cover was less in terms of the long term for the 500 millibar heights and the SAT two and three point indexes, as well as when you separate each of these variables into two separate regimes, each individual regime's strength to the ice cover was still stronger than this teleconnection pattern index, showing that these atmospheric patterns play most likely a larger role in the ice cover in the Great Lakes region than the teleconnection patterns do. And with that, I just want to thank my mentors, Dr. Brent Lofkin and Dr. Gia Wong for their support throughout this fellowship, as well as everyone at Plural and Sigler for their support throughout this. And I'll open the floor for questions. Thank you so much, Colin. Wonderful job. Um, if we have any questions for Colin, please raise up your hand. I do see one in the chat box from um, Teresa Delic, uh, but I'm not sure if that was for um, Colin or for um, Julie prior to this. Um, Teresa, if you have a question for Colin, go ahead and, and put your hand, hit your hand raise and I will allow you to unmute yourself. Okay, I see a couple of hands up here. So Philip, I'm going to, uh, you can go ahead and unmute anytime you're ready to ask your question. Colleen, uh, this is Philip Chu, and uh, it's really good result and uh, very interesting analysis. I do have two questions. Well, obviously you have two good mentors working with you this summer. So my two questions, number one, it's you using the ice, average ice cover plus and minus one sigma to define your uh, cold and warm or high and low ice year. Uh, I'm just curious, what's the sigma value? And do you think the result will be any different uh, if you're using two sigma instead? Oh, for sure. I think that the choice of our uh, sigma was very important, especially when we looked at other lakes as well. For example, the lake such as Lake Erie generally has higher ice coverage on average, so the mean is a lot higher. So when we try to do that same analysis, we're using just one sigma, oftentimes we would end up where our range would include on the high end would exceed 100%, which is what we know is not possible for ice cover. Oh, lake. I see. So okay. we chose that. If I remember off the top, I don't know off the top of my head um, what the number actually is, but I believe it was around 50 to 60%. The steering deviation was around, I believe, 20% for Lake Superior. And if you increase that range, then you obviously are going to have less ice years, and you'll focus right. more on the extremes of the high and low ice cover, which are definitely right. yielded. Yeah. Yeah, so you will have a few events. My, my, good. My second question is for your comparison between the high and low ice year, you're using the annual uh, annual average difference, correct? Yeah, we were looking at the annual maximum ice cover or all the right. collective because, ice cover all the Great Lakes. Yeah, because we, we only look at the ice season. Would it make any difference if we only compare the three months uh, winter season instead of the whole year average? Oh, perhaps I didn't say, but to clarify, um, we took it, we only looked at the monthly patterns for December, January, and February oh, to create perfect. our yearly averages. So okay. we did not do the Good. Excellent. Uh, that's, that's all my question. So thank you for okay. clarifying that. Great. Yeah, Great work. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you, Philip. Um, Ayumi also has a question for you, Colin. Um, so Ayumi says in the chat, uh, great talk, Colin. Would you think teleconnection patterns before winter may present some relation with, is that the annual maximum ice cover, Ayumi, AMIC? Um, she says, so that, yes, thank you. Um, so they may help forecasting ahead of winter. So I'm going to read that again. Uh, would you think teleconnection patterns before winter may present some relation with annual maximum ice cover so that they may help forecasting in advance of winter? Absolutely. Thing. For this project that we did, we unfortunately did not dive too much into what the relationship between teleconnection patterns and the maximum ice cover is, because there's already a lot of research that's already been done on that. So we really didn't look into that too much. However, we did try to look at lead times for the indexes that we created by looking at different monthly averages. We also looked at potential lead times by using monthly averages from October, November, and December to see what the relationship looked like, if there's any strength in those relationships. And unfortunately, we found that the atmospheric patterns that were very defined when we used December, January, February were not nearly as strong as they were when we looked at the October, November, and December averages. So we kind of disregard that a little bit, mostly focused on the winter portion of December, January, February when analyzing this. Okay, great. Thank you, Colin. Um, I don't see any other questions, so we will allow you to take down your slides and thank you again.